What's up, Unbroken Nation? Hope that you're doing well wherever you are in the world today. Very excited to be back with you. Another episode with my guest, Katie Spots. My friend, how are you today? What is happening in your world? Yeah, doing well. How are you? I'm very well. Super excited to chat with you. Um, your story is really interesting and fascinating. Um, you've accomplished a lot in your short time here on Earth, and I think it's really beautiful and empowering to see the ability that we have as individuals to find the will, the drive, the desire, the motivation, the valor, all the things required to push ourselves forward. And your story is fascinating. For those who don't know, tell us a little bit about it and how you've gotten to where you are today. So I am an endurance athlete and I do ultra, basically everything, ultra swimming, ultra cycling, ultra rowing, um, ultra running. And so my journey through doing all these endurance challenges and, and what most people will say about endurance challenges is they're more mental than they are physical. Um, my journey started by doubting my own capabilities because I was a bench warmer because I wasn't a star athlete growing up. So it's really been a journey of uncovering and discovering what you're capable of when you lose the story of of, you know, um, who you think you are and what you think you can do and, and just try. So I definitely started from humble beginnings, but one of the biggest challenges today was um, rowing solo across the Atlantic. So that was spending 70 days alone at sea, no follow boat, no helicopter, and becoming the youngest person to um, do that solo. And you were 22 years old when you did that? 22, yeah. Yeah, I think for the majority of us, we were just probably getting trashed. Um, so first and foremost, that's incredible. You know, I, I'm fascinated by this idea that so frequently and so often it is the very limitation that we think that we have, which becomes the thing that unlocks our true potential. And I know that very much in your story, you know, going back, it was about running a mile, that first mile. And so many people feel limited because of, honestly, the, not only the stories we tell ourselves, but the stories embedded and ingrained in us from our parents, society, our communities. And we feel like what we can offer ourselves is that in which other people have laid in front of us. What is it that you've been able to tap into that has given you the ability to step in, not only to the endurance thing, but if you rewind, you go back to kind of like mile one, like what was that about? Yeah. So, I mean, at the core, curiosity is a big part of what drives me, kind of like the kid-like wonder that wants to know how high you can climb, how far you can go, if you could reach that thing. And so I, I love endurance because it puts me in touch with that ability to just get curious, but, um, I mean, the truth is I've done like way bigger challenges than running one mile, but I still feel to this day, my first mile was the hardest and, um, it's, it's only gotten easier. And I will say that, you know, not everyone's going to be a runner or do these things. And it, it really doesn't matter, but for me, it's kind of like, who are you becoming through endurance? And endurance has definitely shown me how, I mean, this is kind of how I describe endurance is suffering gracefully and, mm -hmm. um, and really leaning into that discomfort and feeling the sense of accomplishment that you, you that, to get in touch with your own inner strength and your own inner resolve and, and just, you know, it, it's a beautiful thing. You finish an endurance challenge and you, you can start to look at everything a little bit differently. And this whole idea of, I never thought I could do something and now I can, and, and it, everything just gets bigger and infinite possibilities. And so, um, I, I would say like one of the core things that endurance has, um, shown me, especially with mindset is you know, if you want to make things hard for yourself, tell you, just keep repeating. This is so hard. This is so hard. Why does this feel this way? And, um, there's almost a dissociation that happens in endurance that you're, you're almost just observing, not reacting and, um, having that 
choice in realizing that you have that choice through those painful experiences and just constantly reinforcing this belief that like, you know, it is possible and this isn't hard. Like that's really, you know, a lot of doing hard things. I just repeat that, you know, oh, this isn't that bad. This is not hard. And I could be losing toenails and doing, but I mean, it's not going to make it easier if I just keep whining to myself, but um yeah. Hey, what's up on Broken Nation? We'll be right back to today's episode, but I want to take a moment and invite you to Think Unbroken Conference. That's right. Our next conference is happening right around the corner this December with amazing speakers from around the world who are leaders in personal development, trauma education, mindset, and more. All you have to do to register to watch for free, that's right, zero dollars, come and join us, is go to myunbrokenlife.com, register and sign up. You can get access to the free event. Watch it live with us this December. It'll be myself speaking along with amazing human beings like Anthony Trucks, Jamie Bronstein, Leslie Logan, and a special interview that I'm doing with Dr. Gabor Mate that has never before been released. So come and join us, myunbrokenlife.com. All you have to do is put in your email. We'll send you over the registration. You'll be able to come and join us, watch live. And then if you want access to the recordings or more information there for you to keep them forever. But in the meantime, go sign up, block it off on your calendar. This is going to be a transformational experience that you do not want to miss. Head over to myunbrokenlife.com to register for free. Until next time, be unbroken. There's an interesting aspect of the evolution of your mindset when you put yourself into these situations. And as someone who literally sitting, and I know no one cares about this, sitting here sans a toenail from a training that I'm currently doing, I was thinking to myself, this is nonsensical, right? To some extent, because it's like, what is the point of pushing yourself yeah. like this? What is the point of doing this? And it dawned on me, I was in the middle of running my first marathon and it, it really hit me. I was like, oh, I'm only doing this to prove to myself that I can do it. There's yeah. nothing else involved in this. But you said something beautiful because I, I agree with this wholeheartedly and it's something that I speak about on this show a lot like suffering is a part of the human experience and suffering gracefully I think is very difficult because we do seek and look for accomplishment but often and you know this failure is inevitable and so how do you in this one hand suffer gracefully which I like now want to get tattooed on me because I think that's really powerful and on the other hand know that you're not always going to cross the finish line um okay I mean this is kind of me being brutally honest I have people who will say I own I just ran this far and I'm my first thing is saying like talk say just this to someone who can't walk say just this to someone who would do anything to run that flow or do that little and so going at gratitude I mean there's no loss when you come over you know you're, you're not doing things from a lack you're doing things out of an overflow of joy but I mean I will say that in my early days failure was mainly like not going fast enough and enough or you know and i i've learned to you know i have some freedom from that and um perspective on that and knowing that um you know it's a part of the process and failure isn't the opposite of success it's part of it and um yeah i there's definitely like I just rollerbladed across the Florida Keys, tore my ACL. I've um, broken my pelvis. And don't, I mean, if you do these challenges enough, of course, that kind of thing is going to happen. But you really just have to not take it so personally and really find a way to always see positive. Like, as soon as my ACL was torn, I, I asked my physical therapist, like, how many um, tendons and ligaments do we have? I was like, oh, over 900. So I calculated and I'm like, oh, 99.8% of me is okay. And all 100% of my uh, organs and bones are great. And so, yeah, it, there's always a silver lining um, and that's always worth our attention and not taking failure personally and knowing that everyone does it. And 
it, it's really, I mean, the biggest failure is to not try at all. And as long as you're learning and growing, I mean, that's really what this is all about, learning and growth. And so the biggest failure and the only failure is to sit on the sidelines. And I don't know, I just love that quote, like the man in the arena, where it, it doesn't matter if you're not reaching it. You're the one in the in the arena trying. So that's who, the person who deserves the credit. Yeah. From the outcome. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And you know what? Like, honestly, nobody cares, which is, I think, yeah. is a really yeah. interesting thing. Yeah. It's like you can do, go do these amazing things, speak on giant stages, do all that. And like at the end of the day, like nobody cares. It's like, and that's not, and that's not to be dismissive, right? That's just to simply acknowledge like reality. Yeah. Like the thing that matters is how you feel about yourself when you go and you look in that mirror. Yeah. And one of my mentors taught me arguably one of the most important things that I've ever been told. And it's like, if you want something in life, you have to earn it. You can't get by on charms or good looks in his words, literally. And I've found that that's pushed me both in positive and negative ways. I'm curious when you are in your head, when you're in this place of you're in the moment of struggle, like, what are you saying to yourself? Like, what is the conversation you're having with yourself? Because we all hit that point where we're like, Ah, fuck it. I'm done. I quit. Right. But, but you just keep going. And and I found for myself, if I can just realize that it's, and it's literal, and I know that people until they do it will not understand it. Sometimes I'm just like, just take the next damn step, dude, just yeah. do it and see what happens. And so I'm curious when you're in that place, how do you talk to yourself and how do you pull yourself to take that next moment? So, um, they're like, I think all the time, like all day, all night. And like, I, I, you know, just, I have the ability to constantly be thinking and I like doing that. And, and so running is the one and all these endurance challenges is like my sacred space where I don't have to think, but I do have to focus. And mm. so you're using your, I can feel like mentally very, like if I go on a 10 hour run, I feel very mentally drained from that intense focus. And so before I even get into, you know, of course I'm going to have conversations and thoughts and that kind of thing, but like I do use my energy to focus more than think when doing these things and focusing to me looks like listening to my body and, and, um, whether that's like my pacing, I listen to a metronome and the whole thing is it's like active meditation, you get in the Zen mode and usually it doesn't take like for you to get endorphins, it's going to take probably 30, 40 minutes. So I don't even really enjoy it until it, I keep going. And then the longer you go, the more endorphins you go. And so, you know, even the pain, I don't necessarily feel the pain of what I'm doing until a day or two later. And so, yeah, that's, that's always a rude awakening to just be like, oh, hi, I'm a door fan. And then the next day you just can't even go up and down stairs and are just, you know, uh, just walking super stiff. But one of my, uh, more recent runs was, um, I am stationed in the Coast Guard here in Maine. And so I did a 140 mile nonstop run. So that's 30 hours. You're not sleeping. And not sleeping alone can put you in a weird mental state, um, being up that long. And so it was around one thirty-two that my friends, um, her phone said I had like seven more miles and my watch, which I was doing everything based on my watch that I had five. And so that whole run, like I didn't have mile markers. I didn't have, um, people all along the way. I, I mean, everything was the whole pacing, everything was based on the watch. And so telling me I had two extra miles at that point, like I physically did not know if I could do two more miles. That's how like, you know, exhausted I was. And so I, I broke down on the side of the road, ripping up grass, having my little pity party. And that was it. I mean, feelings sometimes just want permission to be felt and um, it ended up only being five miles anyway, so yay for that. But I I'm all about, you know, being vulnerable and sharing that and hard things feel hard. And it's not a, I d again, not taking that personally and just knowing that 
um, that's part of it and, and choice, you know, there's still that choice. And I, at a certain point you have to be like, you know, medically, am I causing damage because I do things so extreme that those are the types of conversations that I do have. Like you can get rhabdo, you can get all sorts of, um, want, you know, potentially very damaging things if you do it too far. And so I've been lucky not to have that, but, um, giving yourself the permission to feel and focusing on kind of like that, the controllables and getting in that zone are ways that I find, you know, those, those hard moments, I can either prevent them or just let them, you know, not dominate the whole experience and, you know, keep going. What's the thing that drives you like, because I, I think about endurance athletes and we've interviewed a few of them on the show and for, for a lot of them, which I think is really fascinating, it becomes the new addiction, right? Many of them have come through the steps programs. You can kind of name a few of them. And for other people, it's just like, there's always been like that switch, like that's the place that they feel alive. And so I'm just really curious for yourself personally, like what drives you this? Cause I know there, and we kind of glazed over it. So I'm going to go back to it. Like yeah. there are people who are listening, like, wait a second, you did what on a boat and when, and by yourself and how long? So I'm really curious, like, what is the thing that drives you? And I want to rewind to kind of that spot, right? 22 years old, you're getting in this boat to literally row yourself across the Atlantic Ocean alone. Why? Yeah, so I, I can identify with a, a lot of those threads of like how someone might end up being so intensely into endurance. Like there's definitely people in my family that have addiction and I can probably identify with having an addictive personality and um, I mean, there is something to be said about like, I was reading about like post-traumatic growth and, and using experiences to kind of propel you forward. And I, I would say that some of the things like in my teen years formed in me, like that kind of inner resilience and self-reliance that through, you know, hard, harder, you know, challenges. And so. I think that was, it was almost training ground for me to be able to do endurance. And, um, a lot of people that I've seen too, who have had any kind of traumatic experiences, like I know how to kind of dissociate from my body. And, and that's very helpful in endurance, um, you know, to an extent, like you don't want to be so dissociated from your own body that you don't know if you're doing something that could be potentially dangerous. But I think that was, you know, it, it was ingrained and it was almost like a survival kind of, um, instinct in, in my teen years. And so, um, once those endurance events came to the picture, it was like applying the same skill sets of hard outside life experiences and applying it to an arena that you can actually pre create, you know, you could be creative and you could um, create experiences. And I think what was particularly interesting for me for the row is I was so drawn to the idea of, you know, you do a marathon, you could quit whenever you want. You could see a coffee shop and just, you know, you, and then, and then you go, you could just go home, take a shower and you're, you're on, you're on your way. But with the row, what really drew me to it is the impossibility. Like the worst form of punishment is solitary confinement. And so I wanted to know, like, if all I had was myself, could I do it? And like, I, I just wanted to know how, you know, how much we have in us to do these things. And if I had a follow boat, I probably would have quit because if quitting was that easy, like at times I felt like quitting and I was like, well, it's going to take them maybe two days to get here. By the time they get here, I'm going to change my mind. So what's the point? Um, but I liked being in a situation that the all it was. I was either going to overcome it or die like that. I wanted something that intense because 
I wanted to see how far you can be driven. And, and I, yeah, a part of it was curiosity. Maybe a part of it was wanting to develop and work on things that, you know, I felt like I, I needed personally, like more, um, yeah, maybe self-confidence or, um, self-awareness and, I am an introvert, so I I do appreciate that kind of, you know, I don't think there's a lot of extroverts rowing oceans or even, you know, some of these endurance challenges where you can't talk that much. And so I did appreciate that more re opportunity to reflect and just kind of be in my head a little bit too. So. Yeah, I, I actually resonate with that a lot. There's something about... For me, in my own experience, at least, and I see this in, in a lot of people who come from backgrounds where they had to become self-reliant, self-sufficient to, to sometimes to a detriment. I, I personally have learned how to navigate this of being hyper independent and recognizing yeah. like, because eventually, and especially as you get deeper into endurance sports, like you have to have teams, like it's just a part of it, right? You have to have support, i.e. the person with you with the cell phone, right? And the list goes on and on, but there's something about figuring it out on your own that just reinforces your your capability. And it, and for me, I don't know if this was for you as well, but I've just come to find, and I haven't done 100 mile runs and I haven't biked across America. I certainly have not rollerbladed across Florida, <laughs> but, but with the many of the things that I have done, even like this podcast, it's endurance, 365 episodes a year. Like it is about pushing yourself into what can I do? How far can I push mentally, emo emotionally, physically, and then understanding that that process. And I think here's what is interesting and where I'm going with this. I, I feel that many people view most endurance events, no matter what they are, as people punishing themselves, right? And I've always found them as this is where people discover what they're really made of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is something that I am very pro, like, this is fun. This should be fun. If you're not having fun, there's already parts of lights that we have to do, you know, that aren't fun. So if you're going to be doing these things in your free time, they sh should probably be fun. And so, I, you know, like even I do some of the similar events like David Goggins does, and he's always super, you know, serious and I'm military as well. And so I, I, I just, I'm just like, you have way too many endorphins to be that, you know unable to just smile and I, I find a lot of the ultra runners out of all the sports you know there's out of you know the cycling and swimming and all that um there's some very like down to earth you know happy go lucky really relaxed type people so yeah I I it doesn't have to be that way and if it is I, I would just say work on your your mindset more than anything and and finding the joy and um, even if it's not these endurance things, just finding whatever it is that brings you joy and also gives you the opportunity to, to feel like, um, I mean, just knowing how we have a short life and yet we, ha there's just so many things that you can do and experience and, um, it's just a beautiful thing. So how much of this for you is facing fear that you've created in your own mind about what you're capable of doing? Um, what do you mean by that? Like, I, I think that people get stuck in this idea of like, I can't, you know, fear comes and they plays the role and you're stuck in this place where now you're looping around this idea of what you can and cannot do. The way that I kind of navigate my life is I move towards fear. I'm like, if I'm scared of it, like, let's go. Cause I know that's where I discover who I am in a deeper way. And so I'm wondering, I guess the question really, if I were to parse it down is what, if any role does fear play in your life? Um, so a lot of the decisions, like I don't have this list of all the challenges I want to do in my life. And ev because every challenge leads to the next one gives me the confidence to take the next one. I am very upfront and honest. Last year I, I attempted and succeeded at a Guinness world record for the most ultra marathons run in a row. So it was 11 days of running a mar ultra marathon every day. And I was, you know, one of my posts beforehand was like, 
this is going to be a grand adventure or an epic catastrophe. Let's find out together. And so I have so much humility and like respect for endurance. And I could run a hundred miles and do a bunch of these races and I will go into it being like anything could happen. It's going to, you know, there's no guarantees no matter how many times you do it. Um, So, I mean, I guess I'm not, there's not that much fear because there's not much to lose if your identity isn't what you accomplish or achieve. Like in my 20s, I'm 30 now, in my 20s, I thought my identity and all my worth came in what I accomplished, how many people I helped to get clean water, and that was it. And so I think because faith is a part of my story now, I am so much more free to do things without worrying about failure because it's not like, I mean, God already knows what he made me capable of doing. And so it's not like he's going to be disappointed if I don't reach some kind of personal goal because he already knew. And it's just using what you have. Hey, Unbroken Nation, we'll be right back to the show. But I wanted to let you know that you can grab a copy of my first book, Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma, for free. If you go to book.thinkunbroken.com, you can download the PDF ebook version of the book and get everything that I know about the baseline of healing trauma for free downloaded to your email right now. Just go to book.thinkunbroken.com to download your copy of Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma for a PDF for your phone. Again, that is book.thinkunbroken.com. So um, when, yeah, I mean, what's, what's the big deal about you know, that I, I think the biggest fear is usually failure. And what's the big deal if your, your identity doesn't change whether you fail or succeed. But I think um, a lot of these challenges have to do with um, a calling. And I know, you know, I, I, I'm very like logic based, so I need to break down what that means. It, for me, a calling means something that like, uh, um, I'm drawn to it's the thing I want to like I research I spend my time um, reading about I talk to people about the thing I wonder about like whether you're in the shower just going on the walk like what is that thing that you are just drawn to like and you want to know and you're curious about and so I think that is more the driver and um, I mean I guess one of the other like fears that I have is um, I think it, it would be looking back, like the greatest fear I have is like looking back, say I'm 80 years old, looking back at my life and just being filled with what ifs and if onlys and looking back and wondering what would my life be like if I lived the life I was called to, if I lived the life I was meant to. And I mean, that's it. I mean, we don't need people running more marathons, but we do need people to live the lives that they were meant to and they were called to and show up to, to, you know, to, to be their best. And so my greatest fear is, is that. And so in some ways, I guess that is a fear that, that drives me. Yeah. I, I resonate with that a lot. And I think that, you know, for me, it's altruism and it's philanthropy and it's, you know, this, right? This conversation, these podcasts, the the work that I do for adult survivors of childhood trauma and abuse. And it's like, I know that that is for you, um, water. And I, I remember the thing that drew me most to wanting to have you on this show was that. Because growing up, I, I had, and I've shared this on this show ad nauseum. Um, <laughs> but at some point when I was eight years old, I had to go and literally steal water to survive from our neighbor's house. And I grew up in America. I grew up in the United States, not in a place where people desperately need it, but were instead because of various circumstances, I wasn't able to have a family that could afford it. And what I want to go into and what I really want to dive into is your work in that arena. I've traveled the world. I've lived in 12 different countries. I've been to like 40 now. And you see it all over the place that there's this desperate need for water, for clean water, for clean wells, for green, clean systems and latrines and so on and so forth. Talk to me about your journey to being an advocate to help people have clean water sources in their life. Yeah. Before I, I, I just, I, this 
feels like it needs to be said. Like, I I don't want to think about clean water as a cherry as, or a cause, which it, it is, it is that. But even more, I think water is a basic human right. So this is a, a you know, if we think of it more like that, like, you know, we all have, we should all have the right to have water that won't kill us. We have that on our earth. I mean, so I was living in Australia and they were having a drought and this was, I was going to college there and they had all these rules on, you know, if you could water your grass, if you could wash your car on this day. And, and so, you know, every major headline, you'd always hear about this, the water and, and how it might run out. And, and at the same time, I was studying environmental science. And so one teacher just casually said something about the wars of the future will be fought because of water. And in some countries, like especially in Africa, there are wars over water. And I was, yeah, maybe 20 when I found out about this. And I, I, I learned more. I was like, wait, what? Like, people are killing each other just so they can have clean water? Like, this is what I wasted my, my whole life. Like, this is the thing that back in Ohio on the Great Lakes, you know, we have uh, water parks and golf courses. It's the one thing that anyone could get any, like, if you go in a restaurant, anyone could get it for free. No one's charging for that because it's just infinite, you know, never ending and always accessible. And so I think really it was anger. I mean, I got really angry learning about it because I mean, I was just like, this is not right. We could do better than this. Like, what, what the heck? Like, we have planes, we have this, we have all the, this technology. And what really, you know, I mean, dug it even more is it's not like you have to put hundreds and millions of dollars into research. We already know how to do these things. There are already ways to filter water and there are solutions and yes you have to have maintain them and there's ongoing project costs but it's not like we it's a problem that has a solution and um at the time it was a billion people right now it's around 780 million people so it is getting better but when i when it was a billion that was one in six people and as a 20 year old, I was thinking about like, I've been on this planet for 20 years and I didn't know that one in six people that I never even, like, I just felt so ignorant and that felt wrong to me too. Like, how is this not in the news all the time? Like that so many people are dying, uh, like the biggest issue. And so it's so easy to, to want to do something about water when you know, if you care about health, if you care about the environment, if you care about kids, if you care about education, if you care about women, I mean, it touches everything. If you care about poverty, if you care, I mean, and there are projects uh, a lot more now here in the United States too. Um, and that's one of the projects that I'm currently fundraising for out in the Navajo Nation. So they have, uh, they're in partnership with Dig Deep. They are doing some really great work and Utah and Arizona and New Mexico. So, I mean, $50, that's all it takes to get one person clean water uh, in a lot of these projects. And that's for life. And that's like nothing um, in the big picture. So it's, I mean, we can, we can do this. We can do this clean water thing, you know? Yeah. I, 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 I totally agree with you. And you know, there's a lot of different charities that I send money to each month. One is for Wells in Africa. One is for OUR, Operation Underground Railroad, if you're familiar with helping save children from sex trafficking. And there's a couple others. And I, I think that people feel this weird, this weirdness about being philanthropic with their money because there's this thing in their head where it's like $10 doesn't matter. And I'm like, yeah, but it does. Like, you, I recall at one point, and I don't know where you're at on this, but your goal is to bring 100,000 people clean water. How close are you to that, and have you surpassed it? So it's great. It's a, getting close to 50,000, and I am kind of setting, laying down 
some of the, you know, groundwork for my next campaign. And I think that's going to be the one that, you know, we surpass that. Um, so uh, I'm really excited about the next adventure because I, I will likely be um, able to visit all these water projects on the route. And um, they're going to be like more like Sawyer water filters. So at home ones that are I mean, it really doesn't get much cheaper than the, the Sawyer filters and they're very effective. They can last for over 10 years. That's what I use when I go on adventures. So it's cool to know that that's what I use. That's what, you know, a lot of outdoor people here in the United States use and um, it works and it's just as easy as giving someone one of these filters. So. What does yeah. it take to get to this remainder of 750 million people? Like, what is it going to take as from us as a society and, and a, a species and a race to be able to do that? Yeah, I, I, I wish I like could answer that with more certainty. Um, a part of my lane, I like kind of stay in my lane of like, I'm not an engineer, I don't know, but I know yeah. that, that, um, I mean, I, I, from where I stand, it, it's a funding issue. I mean, that's what's standing in the way of, of people and, and clean water. So, um, yeah, I guess you would have to take that big number and times it by 50 and figure out how many millions or trillions of dollars it would be to get there but yeah, yeah to, to your point like about it 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 takes a lot of people doing a little thing it does not take one you know that that's how most things are you know a lot of people doing a, a little a little bit so yeah very much so and the little things add up it becomes exponential at points right because it starts with one and it always starts with that first decision that first step that first effort and even though it may seem insurmountable like in time like i believe this as humans the only thing keeping us from reaching our goal is just simply time like yeah. and if you can kind of like wrap your head around that and sit in it and go this is the goal and so between now and the moment of that, and instead of it being so wrapped to time, because, you know, I think that's where people fell a lot. They go, I'm going to do it an X amount of time. I'm like, well, what if you just did it, right? What if you just did the thing you said you were going to do? Would that play a role in your life? And, you know, I even teach my clients this when I'm coaching them. I'm like, guys, look, the thing that we need to do is just create the change. We didn't say we need to create the change now, because I'll tell you this, it's taken 12 years for me to get where I am and to get to where I want to go is probably another 50. Like I highly anticipate I'm going to be dead before I end generational trauma and abuse in my lifetime. But we plant the seeds today because they come exponential. When when you think about the the image of the world that you get to leave behind and the thing that you get to create, like, what does that look like for you? And what does it feel like for you? I mean, uh, I'm very like attached to everyone, have everyone everywhere having clean water. I'm very personally, like, I feel um, that the hundred thousand is doable and with the right partners and sponsors, but I, I mean, yeah, that's, that's always been something that I've felt like heavy on my heart of just wanting to, to, to go big for, for water. And I, what's also very encouraging is, I mean, water, you can actually see that impact. Like, um, on my website, I have every single project on Google Maps with pictures and the number of people. And I can visit these projects if I have visited these projects, but I, a part of me doesn't want to get too attached to the end result. And, and even though I have those numbers in mind, it's like, kind of like if you're really honed in on what's the next best step for me, that kind of leads you to those end results. So um, that's another thing I'm mindful of, of just like, is this the next best step? And 
and and not being so attached to this end result that I might be even missing out on a better opportunity or something that could lead to something bigger. Would it be fair to say then that you look at that as like a marker and a direction to move towards, but not like the pan ultimate result? Yeah, exactly. And I, I also have to say that, I mean, it's not me anyways. Raising these kinds of funds is, it's, it's really the people. I mean, I'm not doing it. It's there. I'm just, you know, bringing attention to it. But at the end of the day, the people that deserve that credit are the ones who actually donated. So I, yeah. I I think it's important to kind of, yeah, for me at least to know that it's really about the people and, and, and what they, their action, um, just as much as my own. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's important. Like I, I try to always recognize myself for doing these things, but to also simultaneously realize I, Tom Bill, you told me the most important thing I think anyone's ever told me, he said, You have to do this, but the second you make it about you, you lose. And and I I remember that being like just such a powerful thought. Like what was the journey? Have you always had that thought in your head in that similarity? Or was there a moment where you're like, wait a second, this isn't really about me? Because I... I'll say this for me initially, I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to change the freaking world. I'm going to be a rock star. This is about me. And then I realized like, no, that, that doesn't feel true anymore. I mean, I guess maybe faith has something to do with that. Like, I, you know, I, I know I could be a hard, you know, hard worker. Like, that's what what I could say. I've achieved these successes in endurance because I'm a hard worker. But truthfully, um, being hard worker, working, some people are born with that trait, and some people aren't. And so, can I really take credit for something that I was given? And so if, if I am kind of using faith as a foundation of what, where I live, then God gave me all of my abilities. And so can I really take credit for being hardworking? And I mean, you could be hardworking and not, not use your gift, not use your talent, but I think it's recognizing that I didn't make me like, and so in that sense, like taking credit for your characteristics or, you know, your strengths or your weaknesses. I think it, I mean, it can be very liberating when you don't have that kind of attachment because, um, a lot of it, you know, I think especially doing the row, like if I cared too much about some kind of external validation, I probably wouldn't even have done anything at all because I mean, I started out the gates with like the New York Times being like, bam, this girl's not going to make it. Check mm. her out. And that was like my biggest article because I got in an accident on Lake Erie and nearly destroyed my boat. So I didn't come out with like this raging support. And, and so not being super attached to positive or negative kinds of feedback and just really honing in on what am I called to do it it's there's a lot of chatter that you can just quiet when when that positive or negative doesn't really affect you and you're just focused on your mission your calling and kind of leading with that yeah that's beautiful and i always think about it like this like there are always going to be people who like you and people who don't and neither of those things have anything to do with you (laughs) And there, and there's freedom in that because then you get to go, wait a second, what actually matters here? And again, that comes back to this thesis that I have about the most important thing is about how you feel about yourself when you look in that mirror. Because every day there are people who will love you and they will cherish you and put you on a pedestal. And then there's the New York Times, right? Yeah. And so, but if you, if you focus on that instead of the mission, you're, you're going to ultimately capsize, right? I mean, yeah. unless you have a right sizing boat, but that's a whole nother conversation. Um, this, <laughs> this conversation, however, has been really incredible, Katie, for people who want to learn more about you, who want to get involved, who want to support your mission, 
Can you tell them where they can find you? Yeah. So uh, my website is katiespots.com. If you'd like to support the cause, there's a donate button there. And then I'm on Instagram at Katie Spots and Facebook at Hello Katie Spots. Brilliant. And of course, we'll put the links in the show notes for the audience. My last question for you, my friend, what does it mean to you to be unbroken? Um, to be unbroken is to be in touch with um, the who you are, not based on fear, but joy. Mm, beautifully said. Thank you so much for being here, my friend. Unbroken Nation, thank you so much for listening. Please like, subscribe, comment, share, tell a friend. And until next time, my friends, be unbroken. I'll see ya. We'll be right back to the show, my friend, but I wanted to let you know about our brand new podcast community for Think Unbroken Podcast. I know that for so many trauma survivors like myself, for the longest time, I felt alone, like nobody got it, nobody understood, and that I was just going to have to figure this out on my own. But that's not true. And the reason why we created our brand new Think Unbroken Academy podcast community is so that we can bring all the members of the Unbroken Nation together in a place where we can learn, grow, heal, change, and transform our trauma into triumph. I would love to have you come and be a part of the brand new community. Just check out thinkunbrokenacademy.com or click the link in the podcast description. And I cannot wait to see you there, my friend. Again, just head over to thinkunbrokenacademy.com. And until then, be unbroken. Thank you so much for listening to Think Unbroken. Please share this episode with someone who could use it and help us move forward in our mission of ending generational trauma in our lifetime. And if you would, please take five seconds to pop on iTunes or Spotify, hit that five star, leave a review, and you can also reach out to us on social at Michael Unbroken or at Think Unbroken. And of course, you can check out our YouTube channel at Think Unbroken. Thank you for being a part of Unbroken Nation, my friends. And until next time, be unbroken.